onto these SAV habitats and how we as scientists kind of go out into the delta and the bay and basically anywhere and measure the SAV, kind of figure out how it's doing, how healthy it is, and how we can basically apply restoration techniques based on what we see out into the environment. So let's talk about what is SAV. So just think about what you guys imagine when you hear the word submerge aquatic vegetation. Because some people think of a lot of different things, right? So some people can think of marsh plants. They can think of seagrass. They can think of algae. So let's look at marsh plants, for instance. You look at a marsh, just imagine a marsh, right? You're driving down to the island. You see on the right-hand side a beautiful marsh, absolutely gorgeous, tons of plants, just so, so pretty. And then we think, all right, is this submerged aquatic vegetation? Well, we think of the word submerged. And you can obviously see that the marsh plants completely, not completely out of the water, right? You're walking through it. There's still water on the ground, but it's not completely submerged. So therefore, it's not submerged aquatic vegetation. It's not SAV, which is still fine, um, but it's not necessarily what we are focusing on today. So now we know marsh plants, not SAV, but what about seagrass and algae? Seagrass, that is completely submerged underwater, and it is a type of vegetation. All right, now this is confusing, right? Is seagrass, is it SAV? Yes. Seagrass is a type of submerged aquatic vegetation, but not all SAV is seagrass. And the reason for that, as we talked about like what an estuary is, is SAV can be found in more fresh water, like all the way up from Minnesota, Wisconsin area, and we can see it all the way down to the more salinity areas, like the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. So, and even if we break down the word seagrass, right, it's a grass that's in the sea. So seagrass is found in more like salty environments, SAV can be found in both salty, brackish, and fresh environments. And that's just an important distinguish to make. So now let's think of algae. And specifically, like, let's look at kelp, for instance, right? We don't really see kelp down here, but it's still like a good example. It's like a long type of plant looking like structure. It has almost like these leafy characteristics, but it's an algae. It's not like a true plant. So SAV, a plant, those are angiosperms. So those are more flowering type of plants and they have a root and rhizome structure. So with SAVs, they basically bring up their nutrients through the roots and rhizomes while algae, they can get their, their nutrients kind of just through the water, right? And also algae, they have more of an anchoring system so they can attach onto just rocks and harder substrates without needing any roots to go into the sediment like we see SAV have. So now that we know what SAV is, right? It's a completely submerged underwater plant. It can be found in both fresh, brackish, and salty environments. Now it's also important to understand what they look like because say you are, let's say you're kayaking up in the Delta, right? And it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. You see the marsh, but you know that's not SAV. So therefore we don't really care about that right now. And you look down in the water and then you see these completely submerged plants. But how can you really tell what it is like versus algae? So I brought in some examples to show you if we can see them um, and feel free to afterwards come up and look at them because they're, they're small characteristics that really change the species, which can make it like a little difficult to ID when we're actually out in the field. And while I go through these, I'm going to also touch on important ecological values that we see um, throughout just all these species. So let's start with the first one here. Our first species I brought into us is Valcinaria, um, also called wild celery. That is a common name. And oh gosh, it's hard for to see, but I will quickly lift it up. So this plant, it's a very thick blade. It can be extremely long. And it, it's more of a, a simple type of habitat structure, but it's still extremely important for certain fish, other invertebrates, and other organisms basically to thrive within this environment. So with that kind of simple structure where the leaves are long, thick leaves, right, it provides, it's a fantastic nursery habitat, right? So juvenile fish, ones like speckled trout, red drum, uh, southern flounder, all of those types of fish, when they're in their younger state, they really utilize this habitat for protection 
and shelter from predators, and they also hold a valuable food resource. And even when I was sorting out these plants this morning, and I just, and I, we collected these about two weeks ago, kind of up in the Delta, and even just not even taking a core or anything, just scooping them up, they had a bunch of just small, tiny invertebrates and mollusks and just amphipods, a, a whole bunch, just living within the niches of these plants. So that's actually very cool to see. And I'll also show you where we collected these on the map. So these species that we see here collected these in the Delvin Bay area. So this is like the causeway. And here, like the battleship is around this area. And we just went in two weeks ago around this area. And this is more of a fresh, freshest, more brackish type of area. So we aren't really getting seagrass uh, when we are going up to this to collect. So these species that I have aren't true seagrass. That's why they are just SAV. Um, so again, and not only is the fisheries aspect important just for the environment itself, but it also helps us because I'm sure there are plenty of people here who do enjoy fishing, right? And the target fish can be, you know, red drum, speckled trout, flounder, right? People love fishing for these species. People love eating these species. So without the SAV environment, they're not really gonna have a chance to really grow and thrive before they're big enough to really survive in the open water, right? So it helps us economically to help support our fisheries industry with this specific habitat. And it's really unfortunate that we don't really hear about like submerged aquatic vegetation on the news or online, right? We mostly just hear about the sea turtles and the manatees and the fish, which is still all fantastic species to be aware about, but it's also so, so important to understand that th these SAV species are the foundations of how these other species that we care about really thrive. So, and the interesting thing about SAV is that they come in all kinds of different characteristics, which makes it a little bit difficult to ID when we actually go out and measure them. But it's important to understand that these different characteristics really provide different types of functions within that same habitat. So for instance, we have this species, Rupia. Its common name, oh gosh. I am blinking on its common name. Widgeon grass, my bad. So this, it's really hard to see kind of outside of the water just because everything kind of sticks together. But it's basically a very thin, almost string-like species. While our Vallisneria there, it was very obvious to see, right? It had thick blades, very long. This one is very, very thin, but it provides different functional habitats. And this species, Kind of right next to it and yeah i ensure you guys to come look at these afterwards because i'm sure it's so difficult to see but this species is stucnia and this species is great for fowls to really eat it's a good like food resource just for different different birds um, so with these different functions it all incorporates into one big ecosystem right so you can have these different characteristics and still have a completely balanced, fun, functional habitat. So it's, it's just important to note those uh, specific characteristics. So now I'd like to go back to our little theoretical situation of us kayaking up in the delta, and say you're kayaking, and all of a sudden your paddle gets kind of stuck, and you try to pull it out, and all of a sudden there's this really thick and heavy kind of species right and stuck on there, and you have to pull it out, and it's just so dense. It's a dense, thick blanket of SAV and you throw it out and you wonder, okay, what is this? That is the species Eurasian milfoil. And I'm sure plenty of you have heard of this species before. It's, oh gosh, so hard to see when I pull it out of the water, but it is a more, let's see if I can tip it up a little bit. Maybe? Oh, oh maybe. Oh. Kind of. That's all right. But basically, the structure of Eurasian milfoil 
it gets really, really tall. It's really, really long. It has this feathering type of structure. So it's basically kind of one stalk and you see feathers kind of go out of it. So it's not one thin blade that kind of goes up. It's a more complex structure. Now this can be good and bad in different ways. It is invasive and the overall, uh, it's overall negative to the environment. And I will explain why it can be kind of tricky to determine whether it is or isn't. Bethany, let's talk about what invasive is because um, sometimes that's used colloquially. Um, yes. And, but we're talking about a more specific set of characteristics, so. Yes. Yeah, an invasive organism is one that did not evolve in an area and it is um, introduced into an area where it causes a lot of environmental problems. So this is not merely, um, you know, a species that's very competitive, um, aggressively competitive. It is, it was introduced into the Mobile Delta and it is causing environmental problems there. Yes, yes. And the different types of problems that it can cause is that one, as I mentioned in our little hypothetical situation, it was very dense, right? It's very dense. It, it grows in a very thick, kind of thick clumps, thick beds. And some issues that could happen from that is that it can prevent oxygen from diffusing in and out of the water. And when that happens, it creates more of a hypoxic zone right underneath, especially where our juvenile fish are trying to forage, where they're trying to find shelter, basically, you know, where they're trying to live before they grow older and move into more open waters. So all of a sudden, <coughs> they don't have enough oxygen to, to survive. So they're probably not going to be in this SAV habitat anymore, which is very unfortunate because then where do they go, right? They either move somewhere else or they unfortunately die off, right? And we don't want that. As we said before, like we want we want our speckled trout, we want a red drum, right? We want it for the environment and we want it for us. So that's a huge negative that can come from Eurasian milfoil and the fact that it's so dense that it can prevent light from penetrating through the water and that's gonna cause issues for other species like Vallisneria to grow. Because all of a sudden, where's all the light being taken up? It's only being taken up by the Eurasian milfoil. It's not letting any other, any other nutrients, any other resources be given to other species. So it takes up space, it takes up light, and it just prevents a lot of oxygen from being distributed in that same environment. So it's just such a, such a thick kind of, I don't want to say evil, but it's just a, such an invasive species, gosh. And it's reproductive, um, it's the way that it reproduces also can cause similar issues. Because like in, in our theoretical example, right, we're pulling off the Eurasian milfoil that's stuck on our paddle. We're kind of just throwing it through the water, which is fine. So obviously we, we don't want it on us, right? There's stuff we do. But then we're creating fragments. And when we create fragments of milfoil, it can break off from the top and grow almost a whole new individual. So not only can it reproduce sexually, but it can also just clonally reproduce just by breaking off and making a whole new individual. So it's very difficult to try to control that because it is everywhere and it can just be spread through boats, just through people, through wave action, right? It can be dispersed in so many different ways. So, so um, let's, let's clarify a couple of points when we're talking about sexual reproduction in plants. Yes. Um, you know, that would be like the, um, the different reproductive parts of the plant, um, you know, combining to produce a new plant while the asexual production is sort of done through this fragmentation. And you mentioned that some of these plants have different, um, you know, like functional, like a functional role or a functional um, niche in the environment. So with just throwing out some, um, some possibilities for this kind of functional difference. Would this be like those that are rooted and they grow lower in the water while you've got some that have, have roots but they move freely through the water and um, so they sort of occupy different layers of the water column? Yeah, and by doing that then they provide different services to different um, other organisms, right? So like Valsinaria, for instance, this really wide blade species 
it can grow a lot of other organisms on top of their leaves, like epiphytes, for instance, and that would be like a great food source for amphipods that can easily sit on these big, wide leaves and just eat everything that grows on these leaves, while it would be a little more difficult for that type of function to happen with rupia or stuchnia, for instance, because those leaves are more thinner, right? So it doesn't, it still epiphytes and other things still grow on these, but you know, maybe, maybe amphipods would prefer eating in Valisinaria, for instance. So with more amphipods, they could attract more other fisheries, fish species to eat those amphipods. And, and as I said before, like maybe birds may not want to eat Valisinaria because it's so thick while the rupia or stuchnia could be like more thin and just easier to kind of just feed off of. So that's what I mean by different functions in a habitat. So are you seeing some zonation that is related to possibly salinity um, farther um, north where you've got, you know, less of a, a saltwater influence from Mobile Bay or zonation related to the causeway or, you know, we kind of touched on a zonation that would be like a vertical zonation in the water column. Um, but you also brought up the invasive Eurasian milfoil. Mm -hmm. So um, what is it that you are looking at with the different, in your research, with the different Ooh. SAV? That is a fantastic question because all of those things that you mentioned play into a huge role, like one big role on how speciation could possibly be occurring, how it's influencing faunal communities that inhabit the SAV. So like you said, with the different salinities north and south of the causeway, those are happening. The strong differences in those uh, salinity um, concentrations are happening primarily through anthropogenic processes. And what I mean by that, I mean human-made impacts like climate change and pollution and just the physical barrier of the causeway. So we are seeing a, yes, thank you. A big salinity difference, like the causeways here, right? It's more fresh on the north side and more salty on the south. But the issue we're seeing is that there's a huge difference in salinity levels in such a small spatial scale. So we can just look at just a tiny little section and the difference in salinity is huge, relatively. And that can cause issues with these plants who are, again, evolved to only withstand a certain salinity tolerance, right? Valisinaria, for instance, it's a more fresh, brackish water type of species. But if the salt water, and we will see Valisinaria beds south of the causeway, but if the salinity keeps increasing, what's gonna happen? And two things could possibly happen. It could evolve and species and create a new species of Alcinaria that can basically withstand this change, or it can die off. And my research is basically looking at these changes, the physical traits and any genotypic traits that could possibly be occurring. As Valcinaria, there is so much unknown about that species and about the delta, so there's so many potential research projects that could happen, which is amazing. But also, it's a lot, because there's so much we don't know. In Valisinaria, this example that I have here, again, it was collected two weeks ago, so it was October. But the coloration, it's kind of brown, just because you know it's kind of dying off. But originally, like this was pretty green. It was a very, very green plant. But if we go to a certain part of, like a different part of the delta, this plant can be purple, like a nice, like a vibrant purple color. And you would almost think that it's a different species, but it's. As of right now, technically we don't know for sure because we need to do research on whether it is a different species or not, but it's most likely a similar species <laughs> from what we know. So, so let's go back and clarify for those yes. folks who may not be as familiar with this area. Um, so this is the head of Mobile Bay. If you look at this giant map behind us and you follow that green down to the coast, it's a little hidden behind your core. You want to move your core aside Absolutely. for a second so folks can see Mobile Bay. So this is the head of Mobile Bay, right, where the river system connects to Mobile Bay. 
Mobile Bay is an estuary, so it there is um, saltwater flow north into the bay from the Gulf of Mexico, and there's river flow uh, south from this large watershed. And so her work is um, right there, kind of at the north end of Mobile Bay, where you've got some salinity variation that's based on, might be based on river flow, like there are times of the year when you've got more rain, more river flow, um, and that may be more dominant um, in times of the year where there's less river flow, the tidal influence, especially in times when the tidal influence is stronger, you know, that may be more dominant. And then you have this compounding factor of a man-made causeway uh, from Mobile County to Baldwin County. Um, and the original causeway, the causeway that we're talking about, um, was built in the 1930s. And it is not raised very far above the water. So it's built kind of like, it's built up, but kind of setting right on top of the water. And it affects the water flow in that area. So, you know, we are still learning about the impacts of that, um, you know, shift in the water flow there. Yes. So, um, do you want to show some of your sampling equipment yeah. and describe your process? Absolutely. For all right. Now, the great thing about my lab is that we can use very simple, inexpensive equipment that we can just make from PVC, and it's super effective, which is why I love it, like the six-inch core, for instance. So this bad boy, again, just simple PVC, just cut it, glue some pieces together, and you have this amazing sampling equipment, and you can get so much data just, just from this. So I love it so much. So what, <laughs> what you use for it is basically if you just want to grab some sample, whether that just be a plant individual, some sediment, or both, you basically take this, you shove it into the ground, and there's also this uh, cork on top to create a suction vacuum. So once it's in the ground and you kind of jiggle it, you have these handles, makes it super nice, jiggle it into the ground, all of a sudden you got your sample into the core as you shove it into the ground, lift it back up, put it in a bag, take it back to the lab, and you can process it for later. Now what's great about this is that you just collected so much data just from that one simple action because you got the sediment, right? So you can measure what kind of sediment you collected, figure out what is, like, is it clay? Is it sand? Like, what is this SAV growing in? But then you also grab some nutrients in the soil, right? So you can take some of that sample, send it off to another lab, figure out how much phosphorus is in there, nitrogen, just any other nutrients you want to figure out, also just from the sample. You also collected some in faunal community, so some small little organisms that were basically living in that sediment. You can also figure out the relationship between that in faunal community with the seagrass. And you also just collected the SAV individual too. So you can go back to the lab, measure the height of it, you can measure its forage quality, so basically how much energy is available for the next trophic level. You just grab all that data just from one core sample. So that's why it's so fantastic, and that's why we use this simple, simple piece of equipment for so many things. So, what, so give, us a, give us a little picture of what that's like out in the field. How deep is the water that you're standing so, in? To <laughs> these samples. Defense. So SAV is... In from like less than a foot to about maybe six feet of deep water, but when you're in that deep water, um, you need a few people to help you <laughs> get this into the ground. Sometimes you need someone pushing you in the water, like keeping you down, which can be a little scary, but you're totally safe, right? We're all communicating, we're all making sure that everyone's fine. And then you might have another person, like with the like a, a plastic bag, ready to catch the sample as you're bringing this up from the ground, just so it's straight. So you don't lose anything, everything goes in. So it, it's kind of a team effort depending on where the sample site is. If it's in really shallow, shallow water, super easy, you're standing, you're mostly above water, right? And you can just jiggle that thing in. But if you have to be completely underwater, it, it takes a few people. And uh, <clears throat> do you worry about alligators while you're out in the uh, <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> but again, as long as everyone in the boat is communicating, we can see an alligator and be like, hey, 
there's something a little suspicious over there. Maybe let's get back in the boat. Um, and if there's alligators and we need to get data, that's also where this thing comes in and it's really, really handy because we can take data from the boat with this quadrat. So this is a meter by meter quadrat and you actually might see these in terrestrial plant work too and it works the same, it works great. So basically what this does, it takes a snapshot of the abundance and biodiversity of SAV in a certain area. And as you can see, it has a nice gridded structure on it. So we can basically count, there's 100 squares on here. So we can count percent cover on the, if it's like a specific species or all the species or how abundant the SAV bed is in this area. So let's say we see Valsinaria just in this corner and we don't see anything else in the rest of these little quadrats. We'll say, all right, there's 25% Valsinaria. The rest is bare. And that just gives us a good idea on how well that the SAV bed is doing, right? Like, is it flourishing? Is it thriving? Is there a mixed bed in here? So we could say 25% Valisinaria, 25% Stucnia, and the rest is milfoil, right? So it just gives us a good idea on the interactions just between other SAV species and whether it's doing well at all. So. Can you give us a, an idea of sort of the trends in SAV? Like, say, what percent coverage did we have in this area in the 1940s or the 1920s before the causeway? I know that that data is kind of sparse and it's kind of mm -hmm. like pulled together, you know, from yeah. re incomplete records. Yeah. But could you kind of give us like just real broad a broad picture um, of the changes? Historically, I'm not too familiar with like the abundance and biodiversity of SAV through that time period, mm -hmm. but I know that in recent changes, it, it can change drastically. I know my previous lab manager, she, she does a lot of mapping up in the Delta, and she's finding out that some of these beds will be there one year and will completely disappear the next year. And we don't know why. We don't know how they're moving this quickly. We don't know what this changes, but sometimes it'll be the opposite, right? Sometimes we'll get a completely bare area one year, and the next year it's just full of ballasin area. And we don't really know why those changes are happening yet. So yeah. but it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a, an area of research. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> always, always more questions to answer. Right, right, I know, there's always so, so many. <laughs> So um, you are looking at the um, Valison area specifically with your research? My research is primarily going to be looking at Valison area. Um, just because, again, we don't really know much about the genetics of it. We don't know much about the speciation of Valison area. And we thought we knew the species down here. We thought it was Valison area Americana. But recent studies have shown that may not be the case anymore. And we don't know if we just had it wrong the whole time or if it started just to evolve differently or we don't really know what the, what the case is going on there. Um, so that's why I haven't been calling by a species name because we technically don't know. Um, in my research, I'm gonna start with the physical characteristics to see if there's any significant differences on plant height, um, blade width, rhizome thickness, just to see if there's any significant differences in these kind of obvious traits, and then hopefully delve deeper on how these traits are affecting faunal communities. Like, do fish prefer balisin area with thicker blades, or do they prefer ones with greener leaves, or just to see any correlation, and then hopefully get into the genetics of, all right, let's look on the molecular type of structure to see if there's anything different with their genes. So that is hopefully where my research will take me. Uh, <laughs> so um, just to clarify, she is um, near the beginning of her uh, research, and so she is still kind of um, planning out her yes. protocols and Absolutely. methods, right? Um, so you know, this is something everybody wants to know about. What about manatees? <laughs> Well, oh gosh, I'm not a manatee person. Do you ever see, have you ever seen them? I personally haven't seen them, but apparently there was one manatee like kind of by our sites, I don't know how many weeks ago. Um, 
but I know like the mammal lab, I think they were taking them and one kind of came up to our site areas, but I, I, I don't usually see them when I'm kind of up in the Delta, but. Yeah, they're not, they're, there are manatees in Mobile Bay, but yeah. they're not. Probably not. As, yeah. as abundant as they are in yeah. Florida. Um, so what would you like people to kind of um, take away as kind of a broad message about SAV, about Valisonaria, about yeah. you know, what you feel like is important to um, understand? Yeah. Well, I just hope that everyone comes out of this talk knowing just how important it is, like important for our environment, important for our fisheries, important for our coastlines. Again, we don't talk about SAV that much at all. No one really knows what submerged aquatic vegetation is most of the time. But it's just the foundation of our ecosystem, especially in Mobile Bay, the Mobile Tensaw Delta. Right? It's, a, it's the foundation of where all the other organisms that we dearly love, like the manatees and the, the sea turtles and the fish, right? they all need this SAV species, whether we know that, but I, hopefully now you do, so hopefully now you'll be like, more aware like where you're like, boating to make sure your motor isn't really ripping up any of the seagrass or the, any of the SAV, and just, just be more conscious of where like, our fish come from, like, just, just the ecological importance of SAVs. Yeah, so we talk a lot about um, like the services that different ecosystems might provide um, and ways that we might assign a value to, the, to them, a way that humans might value them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we sometimes, um, you know, we're trying to, to estimate that value based on, on things that people are more familiar with, like you said, the fisheries or manatees, things mm -hmm. that people um, they know, they they like, and they they have their own um, personal value assigned to those organisms. But the ecosystems themselves have their own intrinsic value. Um, so I think you know it's important for us to point that out too. Yeah. And um, you know we're we're trying to. Uh, increase awareness of this important ecosystem that a lot of people are completely unaware of. It happens to be in areas where people don't often venture. Mm -hmm. You might have some folks who kayak in the in this area where there's SAV, but a lot of it is kind of um, you know invisible mm -hmm. under the water surface, and the water is often um, kind of full of tannins and um, or sediment, so it can be hard to to see these beds and these particular areas and now some seagrass beds people might snorkel in but um, mm -hmm. these particular areas may not be the kinds of places that people would <laughs> the kinds of destinations <laughs> that people would um, you know be attracted to <laughs> uh, so you know you're right there's there's not a whole lot of awareness of the, of the existence of these ecosystems yeah. And then we mentioned, you know, some of the factors that might affect the, like the kind of the zonation of these, but we could also talk a little bit about the challenges that they're facing besides, you know, something like the causeway, which is, um, you know, kind of a, kind of a unique case, mm -hmm. but um, do you want to talk a little bit about, and the invasive species that's mm -hmm. been introduced, but some of the other challenges that seagrasses have um, you know, the things that have affected the, the populations of sea, submerged aquatic vegetation, <laughs> SAV. We kind of yeah. have, have a history of broadly referring to these, especially if they're in estuaries, as yes. seagrasses. So yes. I have to um, no, remember. totally fine. <laughs> yeah, it was funny enough, when I was collecting these samples, I was talking to my project manager, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm just collecting some seagrass for my talk. And she was like, then why are you up in this freshwater environment <laughs> if you're collecting seagrass? And I was like, you're right, you're right, it's SAV. But um, going back to your question, yeah, there's a lot of physical things that people do that could kind of affect the population of the seagrass, or the SAV. And, um, <laughs> and a, a big one that I kind of touched on was um, motorboating, actually. And we have, um, the Heck and Valentine Lab actually have a project in Perdido Key State Park where they look at the species um, 
Halidouli, Halidouli righty. And it's a more, that is a seagrass, because it is in a salty environment. And, um, and if you go to that area, you see these, a luxurious, a very beautiful bed, right? And the water's very clear over there. You can see directly through. But then you'll also see these straight lines of just bare sediment. And that is from people driving their boats and their motor is ripping up all the seagrass. And that can cause fragmentation and it can cause an edge effect. And it can just, again, basically degrade this beautiful, luxurious SAV bed. Um, so that's one thing that I don't think people really think about when they're on their boats and they're in more shallow water and their motor is kind of low and it's just kind of basically dragging on the sediment bed. But it's, it's so just important to be aware how much that we do affect um, our, our environment around us, even when we're just trying to get through on our boats. Um, yeah, and so let's also um, differentiate between the fragmentation you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. with the... Um, the, oh, the milfoil, the milfoil <laughs> and where they can easily reproduce by fragmentation and the fragmentation of the grass beds, mm -hmm. which um, would be more like cutting the grass beds into little smaller patches with the prop scars, the boat scars. Um, and then that sort of like fragments this ecosystem from, from the point of view of it serving as habitat as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and my understanding is that that can take a long time for those to to heal, mm -hmm. you know, for that um, uh, the seagrasses to recolonize those areas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So, so um, I mean, are there any other kind of human impacts that we should mention? I think you're right, the uh, prop scars are, or the boat scars are probably things that people, they're just, they're unaware, and so that awareness is yeah. important. Yeah, and I mean, direct impacts, it, eh, it's, it's, the population is basically being affected by all the indirect impacts that we do as people, right? Just our carbon footprint, as we see in the, the temperature change, salinity changes, those are all basically due to indirect things that we do that increase our carbon footprint that just negatively affects these types of habitats. So if we can just do the, the basic things to reduce that, it, it'll help not only the SAV beds, but you know all the local environments that we interact with every day. So I just... And um, I don't know what how the freshwater SAV compares to seagrasses, but my understanding is that um, seagrasses are a pretty significant carbon sink. Oh, absolutely. So do, do you know how that compares with the freshwater? Do they kind of function similarly? I haven't looked too much into it, but if I were to make an estimation, I feel like seagrass, mm, because in freshwater, right, there's less fresh water in general um, than more salt water in just the whole world. So density wise, I would imagine that would be the case just because there could be more seagrass versus SAV in more freshwater environments, but they still act as a, as a good carbon. So just to sort of clarify what we mean by that, um, well, seagrasses, like the true seagrasses, we keep using the term a little interchangeably, but the true seagrasses that are actually in salt water, there's only a very small amount of the oceans, like a small fraction of the oceans where seagrasses live and can live. Um, they need sunlight penetration, they are true plants, um, and so they need sunlight, and so they only kind of grow on the fringes of the continents. Um, so it's a really small percentage of the ocean, but they are a pretty significant carbon sink, which means that they can um, like take in and store carbon. So we hear about this problem with, um, you know, warming from carbon that is released through the burning of fossil fuels. So we have carbon that is, that is free instead of like stored. In the, in the earth and fossil fuels. Well, you've got some processes that can take that carbon out of the atmosphere and store it again. And so seagrasses, you know, are one of those organisms that can take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and store it. Um, 
and so you know that that was that's what we refer to as that um, carbon sink. Yes. So thank you for uh, joining us and yes. telling us about your research and telling us about SAV and. Um, you know, some of the ways that we might increase awareness and appreciation for SAV and how we can um, better understand the value of these ecosystems and Perfect. the things that we might be able to do to help. And yeah, I wish you luck on your research. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I would like to thank everyone for coming. And a special thanks to the Heck and Valentine Lab because they really helped me uh, collect all these samples and they let me borrow some of their equipment to show you guys today. So huge thanks to them. So thank you very much. Thank you. And <laughs> you've got some, uh, some equipment right there. I don't know if you want to pull that out and show it. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's a little broken. Uh, not, uh, yeah. not a good visual. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Yeah, and feel free to come up and, for coming and look at the seagrass closer to get a better understanding of what it looks like. So, thank you.